I'm excited to bring you today's episode with my guest and friend, Rob Walling. Rob is a passionate evangelist and mentor for the founders of Bootstrap SaaS companies, whom he serves through the business accelerator Tiny Seed, as well as the community MicroConf. He's also the voice behind the podcast Startups for the Rest of Us, which has released over 600 weekly episodes. He's captured much of his wisdom he's gathered over the last 20 years in his fourth book, The SaaS Playbook. In this episode, we dig into the lessons he's learned as a father, as a husband, founder, as well as investor, tips that I bet will support you as you pursue your business goals for the months and years ahead. For the show notes, transcripts, and links to the resources we talk about, please make sure to visit leadpages.com slash podcast. Now, let's get into the conversation. Rob Walling, thank you so much for joining me for this episode of The Lead Generation. It is my pleasure, Bob. Thanks for inviting me on. I'm excited to get into a lot of lessons you've learned building startups, selling startups, investing in startups. Um, before we do that, though, I'd love for you to share what's one way that you love to transform the lives of the people that you work with. About five years ago, I finally put my mission, which I think is now my life mission, it's certainly the mission of the companies that I run and the podcasts I run, and it's to multiply the number of independent self-sustaining SaaS companies in the world. And SaaS, for those who don't know, software as a service, it's just software startups. You know, 20 years ago, we would have said uh, software, and 15 years ago, we would have said application service provider or ASP. But for me, I'm trying much like I did myself, like I pulled myself out of a very working class existence purely by bootstrapping companies. And then I started sharing what I was doing and people got interested. And so that that's a transformation that I aim for in my crowd. That's amazing. And I've loved working with you in the past. So in full disclosure, you and I have had a chance to work together when Drip and Lead Pages were combined forces. Today, they are no longer combined forces. You're not, no longer part of Drip nor Lead Pages. You are running lots of other cool things. Um, but it is a real pleasure to pick your brain a little bit in the podcasting world. I don't usually like that phrase too much, but uh, I want to share some, uh, get you to share some ideas around SaaS. But before we do that, you and I share a little bit of nerdiness, and I think the people need to hear about this. You had the chance with your son to play Dungeons and Dragons with the son of Gary Gygax, one of the sons of Gary Gygax, a few years ago. I'd love to know, A, what was that experience like? And B, do you have a lesson that you think Dungeons and Dragons specifically teaches you about business that we could take on, even for people that might have never played before? Yeah, so at Gary Con, so Gary Gygax started started D&D, and at Gary Con, which is like the nerdiest name for a con ever, there's like a couple thousand people who are just there to game, you know. And so I, I have I have now have selfies with both of his kind of prominent sons. There's a few others, but Luke and Ernie are the are the ones most people know about. And I, I was in a game where Ernie was the dungeon master. Um, that was a, it was a super interesting experience. And they said, oh, he he DMs like his dad does, and I found it. Very different than we DM today. Very different. You know, it's just a very different style. It's like a 40-year-old style. But it was it was super fun to, obviously, to be involved in that. Dungeons & Dragons, and one of the things that I, I think people outside of it don't understand is it is improv. It's like, depending on how you play, it's like improv with dice. It's like pretend with dice. There's a role-playing aspect. There are puzzles and there's exploration. And of course, there's what everyone thinks about, which is casting spells and hitting people with swords. But that has become such a you know less prominent uh, thing. So with my son, whom I play, he has learned to take on different voices to think on his feet, both if he is being a character or if he is trying to think through a really difficult solution Let's think about a creative way to swing from a chandelier and break through a window. Can I do that? And I'm like, I don't know. Roll the dice. You know, let's add your dex modifier. And so I like the tr the improvisation in terms of both um, kind of verbal, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, of kind of role playing, but also in terms of troubleshooting. That's neat. And obviously, as a founder, you likely take on roles of different types of situations, try to predict uh, the dice roll is a little bit more metaphorical than having a dodecahedron that you're just going to go ahead and spin That's right. out on a, on a table. That's right. Well, and my favorite thing, see, my my D&D my D &D group is my son, who's uh, he's 17, and I've played with him since D&D uh, &D, since he was maybe seven or eight. Everyone else is either a startup founder or like a, an executive at a SaaS company. And so it's a bunch of 
like left brain nerds with the right brain creativity. And so, and really people who do, everyone takes initiative to like do things, you know what I mean? Because they're all like driven people. So it is a really fun, uh, it's a really fun group to see interact. That's awesome. Uh, speaking of family, last episode, we had a chance to talk to your brilliant wife, Dr. Sherry Walling. Uh, I asked her a similar question. I'd love to get your input on this as well. You are running a dual successful entrepreneur household. Uh, any tips for those of us that, like myself, yourself, um, have an independently uh, driven spouse doing their own thing in their own mm -hmm. business while you're doing your own thing? Any tips for success in that kind of uh, relationship? Yeah, something that we learned probably a little later than I wished is we, since we are both successful entrepreneurs running these businesses, we do have more money than if it was just one of us working. We could live on either of our salaries, but obviously we have some excess capital. And uh, growing up, you know, uh, dad was an electrician, mom was a homemaker, money was always an issue. And so I've been, I've had this mindset of like, what's it called? Not the opposite of abundance, scarcity. I've had this scarcity mindset. I grew up with it my whole life. And so Sherry and I we had these massive savings and, and we were just frazzled at both ends because we, I, I was like, well, we, we can't pay someone to like clean our house because that's not what work, that's not what solid work, you know what I mean? It was just dumb. It was dumb. So pretty quickly, to be honest, cleaning the house we paid for early. And then then it was like doing our lawn. And then it was like, hey, our, you know, one of our sons is, uh, goes to school 20 minutes away, 40 minute round trip. That's not quality time in the car. <laughs> I see him a lot. I'm not, I'm not outsourcing my parenting, but then we hired a driver who became kind of a nanny, who became kind of a household manager because she could manage the sprinkler folks and the cleaners and she does shopping. So anyways, depending on your budget, like the ability to out, outsource in essence, I bet Sherry said the same thing, didn't she? She did not. Uh, she was talking okay. about how excellent your communication and planning for the mm -hmm. year has been and having growth years alternate, basically. Uh, so again, tune into the That's previous true. episode, episode 62, yep. uh, for, for that conversation. But I, I love that idea of, um, of, of household help, especially. I think it's one of the tips I often share with people when they're like, who should I hire first for my business? I'm like, mm -hmm. somebody do your house stuff <laughs> because mm -hmm. there's so much stress around that. So really good tip with yeah. that. Uh, speaking of family, you've had the chance to build up software companies and uh, found a couple. You mentioned in your book, which, you know, obviously those of you that are watching should pick up SAS Playbook at sasplaybook.com. Um, but you mentioned in your book this idea of treating your team as a team and not a family. Uh, and for those that are ready to hire their first, maybe their fifth employee, most of the people listening, you likely have small teams or newly developing teams. Can you share a little bit more about why you think people should approach it as a team instead of a family? Because you can't fire your family members. <laughs> and sometimes you need to let somebody go, you know? And I've, I've worked at companies, I've been, you know, from a distance associated with companies where the founder doesn't run it like that. And it's like, oh, we're, we're all just a fan. Aren't we just super close? Isn't this just great thing? And then, and then they have to like do a round of layoffs or they have to fire someone who's underperforming. And people are like, oh my God, you betrayed us. You know, the trust, there's just no trust versus if you come in the door and I say, look, we are, we are high performers. Everyone here, I have very high expectations of myself and of everyone else on this team. And if you don't live up to those expectations for an extended period of time, obviously, each of us goes through life stuff, you know, ups and downs. It's not like two weeks of underperformance, you're gone. But over time, if you are not playing, if you're not the best person for your position, we will move to remedy that. And sometimes that's a great, you know, mutual fit to do it. So I think thinking of us as, as emotionally enmeshed individuals is, is perhaps a good way to run a family. That's even debatable. <laughs> I grew up uh, kind of in a more enmeshed family, but I really don't ever think it's a good way to run a company. And on the flip side of that, I imagine hiring people that are your friends or that are family members makes it less likely to get a team players on the first place, right? It's a big mistake I see. So I'm, I'm invested in 151 companies, startup companies. And some, when I say startup, I mean, one of them, actually, I guess I got bought out of that one, but including WP Engine, which is a billion dollar company, like that's in there, right? So startups ranging from a couple thousand dollars a month up to literally millions of dollars uh, in revenue a month in the tech space. And it, a mistake I see, it, it, it almost never works out every once in a while it does, where two family members work together. Um, I've seen it work out where they co-found the business and they are equals and they really are on the same page. I've seen husband and wife teams work. I've seen like two brothers or brother and a sister. 
But I've, when there's a differential in power, I see a founder who's like, oh, well, my cousin could do customer support because he works at Verizon and you know, we're going to uh, you know, take him in and do that. The problem there is there's a, a dual relationship. The odds of the cousin actually being the best person are really, really low. <laughs> then if you, re if you really ran a job search you know, and, and got 100 resumes, are, are they likely to be that? And it's not that your cousin's a bad person. It's that then you think twice about letting them go. Or there's always this question in the back of people's minds, if he gets promoted or he, he gets a raise, is it nepotism? You know what I mean? It just creates these dynamics that you don't need to do it. And people, I usually see it where people have the fear. It's like, well, I need the familiar. So I, I know my cousin or I know my brother or I know my, you know, insert my kid or my nephew or whatever. And it's like, yeah, how about run a complete job search and, re if, and have them apply and then compare them with the rest of the team uh, against everyone else. And if they are the best, then hire them. I like that advice a lot. Do you recommend hiring your kid uh, as a business? I know some people talk about it as a way to help with their kids' finances uh, for later in life right. with opening up an early right. Roth IRA and all this other kind of stuff. But from a dynamic standpoint, as, as a parent, I don't know if you've ever hired your kids for anything particular. Do you stay away from it completely to separate things? Uh, any, any I have. There? I have absolutely done it. And I only do it when I'm working with them directly because I would never curse someone else on my team to work with a 17 year old or a 16 year old <laughs> who just doesn't under, he doesn't know anything about office. Like CCC versus BCC, Bob, how do you, what, what are those fields for? You know, everyone's in the two. I mean, just basic fundamental office stuff. They're not there yet. Right. They're still kids, but I have hired them, for example, to pack and ship my books. <laughs> this ask playbook, right? I had to fulfill a, a few hundred orders. The main Kickstarter, we use a fulfillment center, but there's some things that happened after that where I have a couple hundred paperbacks I had to ship. But that's just, I can supervise and, and handle it. And I'll be honest, I gave my 17 year old pretty specific directions, got him into my stamps.com account. And no joke, he screwed up like five or 10% of the orders. Like he just screwed him up. He's young. He clicked the thing twice. So we kept getting the double charges and I had to go back on a request refund. So it's, yes, I hire them, but I, I hold it very loosely. You know, I do not expect a player result. I'm almost trying to teach them a lesson uh, and allowing them to uh, make a few dollars, but also in that case, it was helped me out. So I didn't have to do five hours of grunt work, but really bring someone on like full time on my team. Like my teams are they're pretty small. They're like five. I have two teams of five. Really, ex I will just say exceptional folks. We we went through a lot of people to find them, and we are have very high standards. And so, just throwing my kid in there, it would just be like one of these people does not belong in this at, <laughs> at this stage of his life. Right later on, I think he will be that player. But man, I can't imagine bringing him in and being like, "All right, report to producer Xander. Good luck, Xander." It's like, oh, that sounds terrible. That's that's wild. Uh, so well, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Tiny Seed for just a moment. So Tiny Seed is a is a fund and investing uh, group. Talk us talk to us a little bit more about that. But more importantly, you really have dedicated the last twenty years of your life to SaaS as a business model. And although a lot of people listening are not in SaaS, I think we can learn a lot of lessons from SaaS. But I do want to give you the opportunity just to give a quick pitch uh, for why is SaaS to you uh, your favorite business model. Yeah, well, I mean, it's the recurring revenue. It's just built into the model and everyone wants it. And if you don't have it, which I have run businesses that did not have recurring revenue. And I was like, well, how do we get that? How do we get the subscription? There's a reason there's like a kajillion subscription razor box, you know, boxes of razors and boxes of t-shirts and boxes of books and boxes that make his subscription is king and queen. That's really it. I mean, the other thing, the margins are huge, right? Compared to even if you could do productized consulting, which of course exists, which is where you just have a single offering. It's kind of like SaaS without the software where humans are doing it. Then your margins take a hit, right? At scale, SaaS can have, and even not at scale, actually, I've had SaaS up doing about 30 grand and SaaS doing, you know, uh, hundreds of millions will have gross margins of 80, 90%. And net margins of 50% are not unheard of. Net margins cash. You know, it, it's just, yeah. it's an incredible, um, it's the leveraging of the technology that, uh, you know, that, that allows us to, to scale and, and do that. And so Tiny Seed, to your point, is a, the first startup accelerator for SaaS bootstrappers. We've been around for five years. And through that, we funded about 130 companies around the world, I think in like 20 different countries. Um, we have a, a gentle focus on the U S but realistically it's, you know, it's anywhere. And that's been a lot of fun. 
And you write in your book, and I, I know it's ironic because you are a fund <laughs> manager, essentially, right? Um, that you are in love with the idea of bootstrapping and not taking on funding too early. Uh, what's the the case for that? Why is bootstrapping, you know, to you such a big deal for what would be successful for any startup? Because I think the narrative is so far the other way in everyone's mind that to do any, oh, I'm going to start a company, we'll raise funding. I'm going to start a coffee shop down the street. Oh, you should raise funding. I'm going to start, I'm going to design a headphone. Well, you should go on Shark Tank. And it's like, how, how about this? How about you go build a product that people want and we'll pay you real money for and then use that to fund the business, right? That, that's the thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm not anti-funding. I run a, I'm a venture capitalist, you know? So like, I'm not anti-funding. I never have been, but I'm against the narrative, this brainwashing, the venture industrial complex has taught everyone, if you want to be a tech founder, you got to raise money. Otherwise you're not anything. And it's like, no, you don't. So that's really what I'm trying to say. And you know, the subtitle of, of my book is build a multi-million dollar startup without venture capital. I'm not saying you shouldn't raise venture, but I'm saying there, there's this whole world out there. I think around 1% of companies should consider venture. 1% of tech companies in the world should consider venture. I think about, give or take, 9% should think about um, like bootstrapper-friendly funding. Like there's Tiny C, there's Indie.VC, there's revenue-based financing, there are ways to do that. And I think the other 90 should bootstrap. So I call it the 1, 9, and 90 rule. And bootstrapping gives you control and it gives you freedom. It is harder than raising funding. It is if someone puts two hundred fifty thousand dollars in your bank account, it's easier. You, you're you're ahead. You're you're at the twenty meter you know line of the hundred meter dash. You have to give up a small amount of your company to do that, but it is easier. So, but I've bootstrapped. Uh, I've I've started six companies, like s substantial companies. Probably in my life, it's probably more like ten or twelve. But like actual companies with like employees and you know six or seven figures of revenue. Six companies in my life, five of them were bootstrapped. Right. The sixth one is Tiny Seed, where we raised a venture fund. It's it's just so possible, and you don't need permission. You don't need anyone's permission to go do that, right? You just build something that people want and are willing to pay for, and you go from there. And I think one one of the advantages that you speak about a lot on your MicroConf YouTube channel, which I'd recommend for everybody, is this idea of focusing on profitability <laughs> so that you can fund mm -hmm. the cycle of growth as opposed to burning through cash mm -hmm. in 12 to 18 months, which a lot of people do if they don't have that profit uh, kind of benchmark for themselves. So I, I think that's that's really ideal. <laughs> so kudos to you for those um, historical uh, benchmarks for yourself, but also for those of you listening, you're in startup phase, right? You're bootstrapping, I'm sure. And you're, you're in that kind of business where you want to grow in a way that's serving your family. And the timeline is just maybe a little bit stretched out right? Compared That's to think of it. getting this funding in a month because you have a good pitch deck. Um, one of the best phrases uh, that is in the book is, you know, build a business, not a pitch deck. So uh, I think that's important to uh, to think about. Now, as I mentioned before, most of the people listening are not in SaaS, but I think they can learn a lot from SaaS uh, tactics. And one of those you already mentioned, which is recurring revenue. Talk to us a little bit about how could a service professional in your mind, uh, if you have some ideas about this, how could a service professional use that idea of recurring revenue? And then I also want to get your your talk on or your thoughts on uh, the idea of pricing psychology within that recurring mm -hmm. revenue because uh, you you speak a bit about should you be the lowest or the highest or the middle. Uh, mm. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, recurring revenue depends on your space, but it, it's both hard and easy to to implement. Like it can be as simple as what my wife, who you had on, on the show last week, did, where she moved from well, you can book me for an hour for X amount to where you can book me for three hours for X amount. And now it's like, I think to sign up to, to talk with her as a founder, I'm pretty sure you have to buy a package of six and it goes for six months. And so that is essentially six months of recurring revenue and you can pay it all up front, much like with SaaS, you could pay the annual up front or you can you know pay it in installments. It happens to be monthly in SaaS, but it can be quarterly or whatever you're doing. So it can be as simple as just thinking of, of longer term packages. Like if you're truly doing um, consulting, one of the hardest parts of thinking about this, if you, if you are consulting is like how to package it or productize it in a standardized way. Because the beauty of SaaS is if I build the software and I have one customer or I have a thousand customers, it's still the same software. 
Now there's a little more support. There's some customer success. You know, you, you and I know there's some more effort, but it's not linear with the number of customers. If I am truly doing, you know, consulting and services, if I have one client or a thousand, there, there's a lot more work to be done. But if you figure out a way to productize it, much like um, Castos. So Castos is podcast hosting. Uh, they're a tiny seed company and they're who I use to host all my podcasts. They have a productized service called Castos Productions, which is where naturally you would think what a podcaster need. Well, they need editing. They need, uh, they're actually getting into more higher end production of even considering whatever, you know, whatever that means. Um, they have a one time setup fee if you want them to like, hey, we'll get you into iTunes, we'll get your album artwork designed, you know, all the kind of early stage stuff. And then on a monthly basis, if you put out four episodes, do you want to edit them yourself? Do you want to fire and find an editor on Upwork? Or do you want to pay Castos Productions, you know, who can edit it, who do this week to week, who like know what it should be, you know, know what it should sound like, right? So they figured out a way to productize that. And what that allows you to do is you don't then have to hire a bunch of experts in anything. You can just hire folks who know how to edit. And then, you know, you kind of, kind of train them up in essence. So I think those are the, off the top of my head, those are the two angles. It's that package mindset mm -hmm. of, hey, I'm going to package up more, or is there something, even if it's not my entire offering, is there something in my business that I can think about productizing? Cool. And then as far as pricing itself goes, uh, you talked a little bit in the past about how when you brought Drip Alive, you started essentially at 49 a month when price plans for competitors were lower, some were higher, et cetera. Um, and you had to build the product to get to that value uh, over time. When when I see coaches and consultants who are doing this membership model, they have recurring revenue. Oftentimes they do start out at that, you know, 10, 20 bucks a month for some astronomical amount of effort <laughs> instead of mm -hmm. pricing it where the value will be very shortly. Talk to us a little bit about your thoughts on pricing in, in a way that's, um, you know, serving the business. Most of us underprice ourselves. We underprice our software and we underprice our services because we, it feels like, well, doesn't everyone know this? Well, I, am I really worth that? Is the software really worth that? I, it only took me a few months to build it. And the, oftentimes the value we provide is substantially more than what, than what we realize. Um, one of the big mistakes in software that I see folks making is saying, well, I'm going to charge less, $10, $20 a month because then it's easier to sell. And then I just need a thousand or 10,000 customers. The problem is, is all the numbers are terrible when you do that, right? Churn is super high. You get really kind of, kind of the worst type of um, price sensitive customers. You get more consumer ish type stuff. It's SaaS businesses that charge 10, 15, 20 bucks a month. I've, I've seen thousands of SaaS companies, right? The internals of them. And those are the worst businesses. I would never run a, hmm. never run one of those personally, especially if you're bootstrapping, right? That's the other thing too. Now, if you had, you have 20 million in the bank and you're trying to be Netflix or Disney or something, well, of course, we know there, someone just said, well, with Disney charges, Disney Plus charges 15 bucks a month. It's like, yeah, they're Dis are you Disney? You have that much money in the bank? Like that's <laughs> the difference. If you're bootstrapping and kind of going up solo, the, you actually want fewer customers who pay you more money. It's just going to be, those are going to be the best, the best folks. I call it aspirational pricing of, Hey, drip was not worth $49 when we first launched it. Everyone was telling me, eh, it's like nine. If you charge 19, I'd stick around maybe 25. And I was like, well, Derek, let's build features to make this worth. How would it be worth $49? Right. And so that's where we started, uh, you know, moving into it, we actually moved into marketing automation, moved into kind of a, an adjacent space because I knew that people were willing to pay more there. Yeah, we, we see that at lead pages as well, where we have competitors higher and lower than us. We're kind of in that in that middle spot. But the ones that are lower, you look at they're they're mostly publicly traded. You look at their balance sheet and they're, you know, hundreds of millions in the hole uh, each and every month. That's not a bootstrapping model <laughs> to go mm -hmm. by. That's a 15 yeah. year payoff. And yeah. most folks, you know, don't want to wait that long for, <laughs> for that. I want to pause here for just a moment and ask you listening, has this episode already inspired you to want to ramp up your online marketing? Well, you're in luck because we have a special offer for our podcast listeners that will help you make your dream a reality. Get 30% off lead pages when you start your free trial today. You can build high converting websites and landing pages in minutes or hours, promote your special offers with pop-ups and alert bars, and track your results with in-depth analytics. Go to leadpages.com slash TLG30 to save 30% and start building your business. 
That's leadpages.com slash TLG30 to get the deal before time expires. Now, let's get to the second half of the episode. Cool. We've, we talked a little bit already about uh, that you have it, this awesome YouTube channel over at MicroConf. You release a podcast and or a YouTube video super regularly. You've been doing so for close to a decade now. I'd love to know what kind of tips you have for the discipline um, as well as the content ideas. So pick one of those two and then we'll we'll follow up with the other one. Yeah. Bob, it's a problem. So 52 <laughs> podcast episodes a week since 2010, 13 years. I'm at 600 and just record 676 yesterday, every week. And sometimes I have to record ahead because I'm traveling, but every week, every Tuesday morning that hits. And then YouTube is also 52 videos a year. And that it is, at times it is a grind, man. I will admit, here's the thing though, about the discipline. So with the podcast, it's rarely does it feel like I need discipline. I actually love the medium. I love talking on the microphone. I love talking to interesting people. And I love thinking about these concepts, right? There's a, I've written four books on this topic. Like that's how much I have to say on it. So for me, the podcast is, it was a labor of love. It was a hobby. I did it on the side. It made no money until I believe we started taking sponsorships in 2018. And it helped us sell some tickets to our events, to MicroConf. That was it, right? So there was not a ton of discipline involved. The times when I, but I, every once in a while I do need discipline. I'll hit a rut, I'll get burned out. And then what I do is I record ahead, I'll record four episodes and then I take a month off. That's how I get over it is I just stop doing it for a while. The, uh, but I will say the YouTube channel is different because YouTube videos are, they're hard. They're hard, like they're outlined by, it's like, here's a topic, talk about this to a camera for 10 to 15 minutes and make it entertaining. And it's like, ooh, this is, this is not trivial to do. Um, that I have needed discipline for. And the biggest thing, the hack that I found is there are several people relying on me. And if I don't ship, my producer gets screwed because he gets behind, my editor gets screwed because they get behind, my person who posted to YouTube is you know, frantically on a Sunday morning instead of taking the weekend off, They're, right? So if I drop the ball, my people, who I'm very loyal to and they're, you know, there's like a trust built up. They have to make up for that. And that's not acceptable to me. So similarly, I, I kind of started burning out on the YouTube stuff about a month ago. This is after about 18 months of, you know, again, 52, just every week, boom, 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 cranking one out. And so I recorded ahead a month, took it off, recorded ahead another month, you know, a, a few weeks later, and then took that off. And now I'm starting to feel it back, like get, get my mojo back. In addition, here's the other thing that always cures burnout, always cures, um, always instills discipline is if things are going up and to the right. So when your numbers are growing, <laughs> you, you just keep doing it, right? It's like we went from 12,000 to 65,000 YouTube subscribers in 18 months. So I'm like, well, I can't not do this because this is the opportunity for us right now, you know? Yeah. Anyways, there's just some, that's a good question because anybody creating content, you're going to, there's the troughs of sorrow that you're in, inevitably going to hit. And when things plateau, do you keep going? Should you keep going? I, in my life, I've found the answer is usually yes. Yeah. I asked that question in part selfishly, of course, as with many of these questions that I asked for podcasts, mm -hmm. that's probably why you love podcasts too. You get to selfishly have um, brainstorming sessions with experts uh, on topics that you're really passionate about as well. Um, but just that idea of batching, I think certainly helps out uh, quite a bit. Talk to us a little bit now about the topics. How do you uh, come up with your topics? Do you have some kind of a brainstorming session with a group of people, peers? Uh, how are you thinking of, of those types of things? It's shocking how that was a problem 10 years ago, and it just isn't anymore. There's more topics than I could possibly cover. Um, for the YouTube channel, we are doing a lot of, we're, we are trying to hit the algo, the algorithm. And so we, it is a little bit like SEO. You know, where we're looking at what are people searching for, what are, what's being recommended, what's working. And then we try to figure out, we have a consultant who tells us, hey, here's like eight topics. Do you have 12 minutes of good content on this? And is this relevant enough to your audience? So with YouTube, it's actually kind of nice because I get fed the ideas. I'll say one out of four, maybe two out of four in some months, we come up with internally, like not the consultant, right? It's not from keywords, but it's like, hey, we want to 
I don't know. I wanted to talk about my Kickstarter, for example, just because I ran a Kickstarter. I've never run one and I raised $108,000 and I was like, whoa, that's great. I want to talk about that. So then we would bring that and say, what, you know, what's the title? Can, can we do this? Does this make sense to, to invest this time? Or we will be doing, we do a lot of like mastermind, paid mastermind matching with MicroConf. And so we'll, I'm like, hey, I want to do a YouTube video on masterminds, not as an advertisement for us, but really the value of them, you know, so we can bring ideas to the table. On the podcast side, it does just naturally seem to come in at this point with the listener base. So it's a little bit of a cheat. You know, I get a lot of listener questions. Um, and then I, oh, well, I guess the last thing though, if you look like probably every third or fourth episode is a, I call it a Rob solo adventure where I'm just talking to a microphone for 20 minutes. Those are all just ideas that I have, right? Framework strategies. And those come usually from being in the trenches. Like they come from a conversation with one of my founders where I'm like, oh, I should really like framework that. I gave them like singular advice on there, but that actually expands. I've talked to like 10 companies that need that, right? So being in the trenches, which I'm sure a lot of your audience is, they're doing active work. You obviously have to anonymize stuff, but you can say like, I have a client who there, I have 10 clients who ran into this and this is how I handle this, right? That's a good way to do it. Other thing is I do consume quite a bit of stuff, right? I listen to a lot of podcasts, uh, both in inside startups, but outside as well. And I watch uh, quite a bit of YouTube. I, in my hobbies, one one of the podcasts I listen to is called Comic Lab. It's about it's two comic artists who are independent creators, and they have Patreons, and they do Kickstarters for books, and you know they're not in the newspaper, but they do comic strips basically. I'm not an artist. No, I do read both their comics, but like I've never, you know, been uh, anything like in terms of of uh, that being a, an interest of mine. But some of the knowledge they share in their podcast, I take and will say, Comic Lab said X, Y, Z. Here's how that applies to SaaS, right? So there's these other disciplines that you can pull in and, and lend to your own. I love that. And I, I love the idea of being able to take lessons from disparate sources because a lot of times if a person's not careful, they can be just another regurgitation wheel yeah. <laughs> of production because yeah. if you're just following like, give me eight topics for my podcast about entrepreneurship and chat GPT and yeah. everybody gets the same eight results. That's you right. know, it tends to get uh, super redundant. So that's really, uh, really good advice. Yeah. Some of the best episodes I've done are where I bring in my loves of the Beatles. Like I have entire episodes where I'm like analyzing strawberry fields forever and relating that, uh, the iteration of that to how you need to iterate on your startup. Right. And I actually have clips of early takes of that in the show. Right. I don't do that all the time because it would get old. It's a little too woo woo for some people or just not, not tactical enough, but the, pulling in from other disciplines, I think is, is something folks should take more of a leap on, right? It feels risky when you do it of like who someone's going to criticize, but those are the episodes that people are like, wow, that was so different. I'll try to make sure to get back to that gold record behind you for those of you not listening, but we'll save that for the, towards the end of the episode. Cause I think it's a cool story, but you've mentioned being able to be disciplined routine this, uh, you know, week in, week out or batching and so forth. Uh, you talk a little bit in the SaaS playbook about decision-making framework for choosing what to work on next. And I think this is really an important skill for any entrepreneur. So talk to us a little bit about your ICE framework. It's something that you didn't invent, obviously, um, something I've used as well. But talk to us a little bit about how that's really been helpful for you to decide what to work on next in, in your projects that you've worked on. Yeah. And what's funny is I always forget the acronym. It's uh impact, confidence, and ease. That's what ICE stands for, right? So this is really, it's a product. Uh, I think it came out of product management where it's like, we have 500 feature requests. What should we build next? Let's maybe internally narrow that down to the top 50 that we think we should build. You throw them in a spreadsheet and then you say, what do we think on a scale of, we can, it, the scale actually, what's funny is the math and the scale are a little bit arbitrary. You could rate them one to five. You could rate them one to 10, whatever. But so you say, what is the impact we think this will have on our business or our customer base? And then what is the confidence that we have, uh, you know, that we can build this and that it will have that impact. And then basically ease is like how, it's the opposite of a level of effort, right? How easy is this to build? So a high, you want all three to be high basically. Um, and then you can just, either add them all together, or I've seen people multiply them together. So I've seen two approaches. And then that gives you some type of sorting. Now, personally, 
I think that's one interesting data point. As a founder who who operates more on gut, I'm as as left brain as I am being an engineer, I, I tend to make product decisions and those strategic decisions more right brain. Creativity and asking my founder about what do I think is next. I do like having that list. I would never follow that list straight down, right? Mm -hmm. But um in the book, I talk more about applying it to marketing approaches because a lot of folks are overwhelmed and there's like, well, I could do uh, pay-per-click ads. I could do content marketing. I could do YouTube ads. I could do YouTube videos. I could do podcasts. You know, there's like all this stuff you can do. What should I do next? And I would say, take all the things you think you want to do. Take that thing you just heard about on the podcast or read about in the book, put them into a spreadsheet and then think about what impact do I think this could have on my business? You know, what confidence do I have in this? And then what, uh, you know, how easy it is to, how easy is it to implement? And I think, again, it's one signal. It's one more data point. I would not, you know, read it as as gospel. I think what it's helpful for me when I see that is it gives you this gut check, like you mentioned, when you see the thing on top, you're like, no, <laughs> that's not the first yep. thing. The fourth thing is the yep. thing that I'm going to do first. And, and so, like you said, it's not a hard and fast thing, but I think it's helpful because the idea of just thinking through, like, what do I really think the impact of this is going to be? And am I full of shit or is this actually going to be what's going on with the confidence level? I like the ease. I've always used effort instead. And so I, in my formulas and spreadsheets, I've had to like inverse the third column when multiplying. Right. And I like the ease pattern better than that makes it much more sense. So um, thank you for that. Speaking of making decisions, this question came in from a post I did on LinkedIn from a mutual a mutual friend of ours, Ben Dugavich, who we both got to work with back in the day. And he wanted to know this idea of persisting versus pivoting. So as entrepreneurs, we have an idea, project, a, a launch of some kind, or even a, an entire business. And it's a struggle <laughs> to get those off the ground. And that could be, again, at the project level or at the business level. When do you persist to the finish line versus pivot or pivot 180 uh, with an idea, you know, what are some of the factors that are going through your mind as you're making those types of really tough choices? Yeah, it's a hard question. I definitely, like we, we launched internally, we had a live stream uh, called MicroConf on air that we launched. And it's one of the, this was during COVID, right? It's one of the few things that we've launched that just really didn't work that well. Like the first one, we got a hundred people watching and then it just, goes down so fast. You know, there's just less and less interest until I'm live streaming for 30 minutes every week to 20 people. And we were asking ourselves every week, like, this is really, it's really low effort because it's just me. It's doing what I do. I'm getting in front of a microphone and producer Xander was working StreamYard and it went to all the things and the level of effort was so low, but we kept asking ourselves and, and then on, it went to YouTube and it would get 500 to 2000 views, which isn't, isn't great for our channel. But it is something. It's like, well, like a thousand people saw that. So is this worth the 30 minutes? We sat on it for like a year, 18 months, just being like, I don't know. It keeps us safe. You know, we kept justifying doing it. And then eventually we're just like, you know what? The, the thing that pivoted us actually was we said, this time would be better spent elsewhere. Like our YouTube videos themselves are taking off. And we were getting mastermind matching. Going. Like there were other opportunities that we saw that were better. And I think that's how I think about it is if we're in a position where I do have multiple opportunities at any given time that I could be working on and that my team could be working on. And so when things start to fall to the bottom, I think of shutting down or pivoting them into something that is working. If you only have one, though, that's where it gets. It's really good to have some type of outside conversations. Like I almost never make these decisions on my own. If I do, it's a gut feel of like, this isn't working. <laughs> this is done. <laughs> We're done with this. We just need to change it. But usually I'm in either a mastermind group where I'm asking opinions. I'm texting friends I know who, I, or who are smarter than me, who are in my space, or I am asking my wife's opinion. I'm asking someone, she's an expert. I, I wouldn't just ask like if she was a, you know, a, a random person, but she like knows how to think through these decisions. So I guess what I'm saying is get outside input. You need the sanity check. I will admit it also depends on where you are in your journey and like the audience you have and how other things have gotten traction. So if I were to launch something today, it needs traction pretty fast. Otherwise it's not working because things I do these days get traction pretty fast, but I'm 20 years into this and I have 
you know, a lot of people on an email list, you know, and a lot of people watch me on YouTube. So it's pretty obvious, pretty quick if it resonates with our people or not. But 15 years ago, 17 years ago, it was not obvious. And I had 500 people listening to me. So it was really, it was really hard to know what was working when. Usually, I think it's knowing yourself. I fall on the side of, I tend to do things for too long. I tend to just grind and grind and grind and grind. So I often have to say, is this really working or is this just what I do every week and I'm just going to keep going, right? And then there's other personalities that just bounce from one thing to the next to the next. And, then, and every other week, you know, they're doing the next thing because the next thing will take off. Which of those are you? Or are you in the middle, you know, and then err on the side of the opposite. So I need to probably shut stuff down a little more, a little earlier than I usually do. And I think some people need to stick with things a little longer than they usually do. Yeah, we we talk a lot about shiny object syndrome <laughs> and a lot of different mm -hmm. angles of that. But I think I've likewise seen people that they just don't persist long enough um, because it's so noisy, right? I mean, watching YouTube, every yeah. video is this is the tactic or this is the business model or this is the this, especially if you're watching some of the videos, like even this one, the next video that shows up is going to be entrepreneurial related. And most of the people doing that are trying to get you to do their thing. So, you know, trying to shut the noise off and follow your gut is good. I also love this idea of talking to somebody else if for no other reason than just to hear yourself talk about it. And then if you tune into what your body feels like as you talk about it, man, that can really be a big game yeah. changer when you're turning that awareness up for that. So um, I like that you you mentioned that too. One of the most common conversations I have with my founders that I'm invested in or advising is this. It's like, we tried this thing and it's kind of working and kind of not. Should we keep going? And that's the advice I'm giving them. That's awesome. Speaking of tiny seed, uh -oh. I have two questions. Uh, so our two last questions. And then I want to talk about this gold album behind you. Uh, <laughs> tiny seed supports... What it's uh, over 150, I think, uh, uh, companies at this point. Um, correct my number, 100, but 130. Yep, 130. Um, what's a cool project that that people listening to this should know about? I don't want you to pick a favorite. Obviously, I don't want you to, you know, pick one over others. But uh, among entrepreneurs, service providers, people that are uh, listening to this podcast, is there a cool project that's in that stage where they could go and buy whatever they are offering and uh, really have their their life impacted positively? It's a really good question and one I have never been asked. And what's funny is we are, we're B2B SaaS, so it's a lot of very niche businesses like, uh, you know, there's commit swimming. So if you run a swim team, then they have great software for it. So a lot of it is stuff like that that's, that's going to be really narrow. Um, but when I go to tinyc.com slash portfolio, which is where all the companies are listed, which is what I have to do to try to, you know, get, get the full list into my head. I think um, if you have... I know, I know most of your folks are not SaaS providers, but if you have some type of software or some type of thing with uptime, Status Gator is, uh, it can monitor all of your cloud vendors and give you kind of a collective um, status, you know, status page and status update on what you're doing. And then the other thing that might be interesting is find email, F-I-N-D-Y-M-A-I-L. That is... It's one of the best, if not the best, way to find an email for someone you're trying to contact. So it's usually doing for doing cold or warm outreach. Mm -hmm. And Valentin, the founder, has built an incredible engine. Like he's a, he's an engineer, and he's he's attacked it in a way with it's like got way more validation than the other tools you've tried. So if you are doing warm or cold outreach, I think that's uh, I think find email is something you could check out. That's really cool. We'll have to take a look at that personally because we do that a lot with our partner program to find new people to help, uh, mm -hmm. you know, partner up with lead pages, et cetera. Uh, next question sure. is around this idea of tools. So you're obviously got a lot of help, but your day to day is on a screen. I imagine you have a tool or two that you rely on quite heavily to be productive or excited about uh, getting tasks done that you're not delegating. Uh, any particular uh, recommendations in that world? I'm old school, sir. I use Trello. I used to use up until even like six, seven years ago, it was still a, still a lined notebook, but Trello is how I, how I get my tasks in there and email, of course. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any particular way that you have your boards organized uh, in Trello uh, that might be uncommon uh, to the average bear? I have to do doing done 
and then I have an on hold to the left of to do because what I've learned is I and I'm pretty ruthless about what I will put on my to do Trello board because I find some people say oh Trello and then they send 500 things to the Trello board in a month. And it's like, no, 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 that's too much. Like you need, if, if you have ideas and brainstorms, put them in a notebook, put them in a mind map, put them in a Google doc somewhere, take the best, the ones that you actually want to move on and then put them in that Trello board. And what I'll find is some things I'll put in the Trello board and then it sits there for weeks. And I'm like, well, this probably isn't that important. So I move it into the on hold. And then I revisit that every quarter or so, right. To say, are there any ideas in here that are actually good enough that I, that I should implement? The other thing I do is the I love Trello's email to board or email to list feature, right? So I have an email address in my contacts that's like this long, you know, GUID, but I just call it Trello. <laughs> and so when I'm in Gmail, I, I do this all the time when I'm at conferences and people are like, you should check out this audiobook, or have you heard about this tool that does this? Or you should really contact this person. Or I have an idea somewhere while I'm like running or on my bike. I like pull over. I pop up in Gmail, I type in T-R-E, you know, in the to field, and then I just type whatever it is there. And boom, when I get back to my computer, it's at the top of my Trello board. And then, you know, there's a next step. If it's an audible book, I go add it to my wish list. If there's a something else, I, you know, I, I obviously go, go do it. But that is how I, it's very, very rare that I drop, I'll say that I drop the ball. I, you, I'm not naturally good at organization. And I used to drop balls because it's like, oh, I'm too much. It's overwhelmed. And now just that very simple system is how I've been able to manage it. That's cool. Final question. You have this amazing set of art behind you. Uh, there's a Millennium Falcon for those of you that can't see. There's a gold album. Is that a Rothko uh, behind your right shoulder or some other artist? I don't actually know. My wife bought it. That's okay. an old fashioned right there. <laughs> Nice and old fashioned. And of course the, the drip, uh, a drip logo. Um, but talk to us a little bit about that gold album that's behind you. And I'm interested since you do play guitar, you have a budding professional cellist in your house. Uh, is there a special, uh, Beatles lyric, uh, or song that uh, kind of motivates you? Like it's the go-to when you're like, you're going to get fired up. So, uh, yes, I love music. Music is like, a, just been a core part of my life, really listening to it. And then I, the first time I picked up a guitar in college, I was like, why did I not do this 20 years ago? You know, and it's just this incredible like connection to it. It's an interesting question about motivation. I don't know that I listen to the, I listen to some music. I literally will pump, uh, eye of the tiger when we're about to do a live stream with my, uh, some of my team and I'll pump it into the mic and be like, let's get pumped out. You know, just being a stupid jokey. I'm not a, like the bro type or to get pumped up, but it's just a fun jokey thing to get us excited. I don't necessarily listen to the Beatles to get pumped up, but I do. Um, I really like, you know, a lot of Paul's ballads, right? So yesterday, Hey Jude, let it be. I like John's stuff too, but really Paul just like moves me, right? It creates that emotion of like, um, it's going to be okay. You know, and even though things are sad today, it'll all be good tomorrow. So, uh, I think that's more of what I rely on the Beatles for. I listen to a lot of punk music, Bob, and that is what I use to get motivated. That's awesome. Uh, so any particular punk we should be listening to for that particular effort? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, no effects. I mean, even pop punk, Blink-182 and the Offspring are super popular, but like, you know, I grew up in the 90s. And so that's kind of what, that's what I'm rotating heavily now. And then uh, mm -hmm. no effects and MXPX are two of my faves that maybe are a little lesser known. And some would argue that's, that's cool. not even real punk because you because they're all melodic punk, right? Where you can hear the melody and hear the words. That's more my style, but uh, that's it. That's awesome. Well, Rob, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. I know you have a lot of ways for people to connect with you. Uh, share uh, MicroConf and Tiny Seed. Where can they find uh, more inf information about those two? Yeah, MicroConf.com and TinySeed.com probably the two best places. Excellent. And I, I forgot to mention, I forgot to ask you about this real quick. Um, MicroConf, for those that don't know, what is it and why is it so different from other types of conferences? Yeah. I mean, so MicroConf started as an in-person event, but it really now is, we call it the original community for bootstrap SaaS founders. And so it is an online community. We do in-person events six, seven times a year um, in Europe and the US. And then we have mastermind matching. We have um, 
we do a state of independent SaaS survey and report every year. We have a bunch of education. We have the YouTube channel you mentioned. Uh, that's at uh, youtube.com slash microconf. So it's a bunch of, it's like free education for folks trying to get better. And then at a certain point, if they want to level up, then they can, you know, look at one of our offerings like Mastermind Matching or head to an in-person event to get connected with other folks that are like them. Awesome. Well, I think we could chat a lot about a lot of different things. Thanks so much for the conversation. If you haven't already picked it up, make sure that you're listening. You go to sasplaybook.com, pick up a copy of this excellent book. Uh, I read it in two sittings uh, this past weekend. Uh, excellent book. I did have the advantage of nine years of already being in SAS. <laughs> so a lot of it was familiar, um, but some of it was really, really good reminders. And some of it was new stuff that uh, we just haven't implemented yet. And I'm really excited to have read it. Rob, thanks so much for joining me for this week's episode. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Bob.